the stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, the battle to take back control of the channel is ramping up, with the government planning to prevent disputes over asylum claims by deporting illegal migrants within days. So is this the bold action we've been crying out for, or should we heed warnings that such a move could break international law? Well, joining me on that tonight, King of the North and straight-talking Tory MP Lee Anderson, who went viral for daring to say this. If the, if the accommodation is not good enough for them, they can get on a dinghy and go straight back to France. Yeah. 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 Lee Anderson live in the studio at 9.40, plus as PM Rishi Sunak and the leader of the opposition battle it out over the crisis. What, what did we on this side of the house do? We gave the British people a referendum on Brexit. No one wants open borders on this side of the house. They've lost control of borders on their side of the house. Does Slippery Starmer's record actually suggest the invasion would become a flood under Labour? I'll debate that at 10pm with my superstar panel, former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, the entrepreneur and activist Adam Brooks and the broadcaster Ashley James. As Sunak elects to appease the Green mob by attending COP27, is this U-turn a sign that we've been lumbered? with yet another spineless PM. That's my digest next. Plus, Sunak was motivated by a desire to keep up with you-know-who, his political nemesis, Boris Johnson, who confirmed his attendance last night. The former PM's father and conservationist, Stanley Johnson, weighs in at 10.20. As Matt Hancock defends his outrageous I'm a Celebrity stint, do you believe his claim that he wasn't motivated by a reported 350,000 paycheck? I've got a wild lineup of jungle stars for tonight's clash. Broadcast for an author, Christine Hamilton, former Lib Dem MP, Lim Beck Opic, and TV cleaning guru, Kim Woodburn. Your verdict, most important too, coming up at 9.25. As one of football's wokest men, Gareth Southgate, says this about the brutal and bloody construction of Qatar's World Cup stadiums. Met with lots of the, um, the workers out there, and they are united in it's certainly one thing that's that they want the tournament to happen oh yeah gary the workers who are alive not the ones who've died building the stadiums so is switching off the tournament now the only way to send a message to the virtue signaling hypocrites of the england team columnist extraordinaire rod little uncancelled on that at 10 45. 
Should royalists stage peaceful protests against Prince Harry when he promotes his disgraceful town hall book in the UK? Political firebrand Anne Widdicombe says yes. She's here to explain why at 9.50. And as a uni professor who promoted COVID authoritarianism like this goes viral after calling for a COVID amnesty. For unvaccinated, we are looking at a winter of severe illness and death. Those who haven't had jabs but could have jabs need to have a badge saying unjab. So should we forgive and forget pandemic hysterics who waged war on our civil liberties? That's coming up in the media buzz at 10.30. Tomorrow's newspaper front pages and Greatest Britain Union jackass on the way to This is Dan Watson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though, a new member of the Dan Wilson Tonight family joins us, the most outspoken man in Westminster, the MP for Ashfield, Lee Anderson. He, from tonight, is our King of the North. And in just a few moments' time, he's tackling Eddie Izzard, the migrant crisis, and Churchill's letters now receiving trigger warnings. Lee's here, as well as Rod Liddell, Anne Whittacombe and Stanley Johnson, plus this superstar panel in the house, former Daily Star editor, their current columnist, Dawn Neeson, the entrepreneur and activist, Adam Brooks, and the broadcaster, Ashley James. But before a stomping lineup, let's get the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you and good evening to you. The top story tonight on GB News 2. Metropolitan police officers have been sentenced to three months in prison for sending grossly offensive messages with Wayne Cousins before he murdered Sarah Everard. And a warning, the following contains flash photography if you're watching on television. PC Jonathan Cobbin and former PC Joel Borders shared messages of a racist, homophobic and misogynistic nature in a WhatsApp group in 2019. The pair have been bailed ahead of an appeal against their convictions at the High Court. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has been urging police chiefs to take action to change the culture within police forces after a report found serious failures in vetting officers and staff. After examining eight forces, the police watchdog found officers who'd previously been convicted of domestic abuse or accused of sexual assault were taken and then employed. It says it found a common culture of misogyny, sexism and predatory behaviour towards female police officers. The report author, Inspector of Constabulary Matt Parr, told GB News the findings are disappointing. Is vesting strict enough? And the answer is no. Uh, that means there's a too great a chance of the wrong people joining. Secondly, uh, did the police deal with misconduct strictly enough? The answer to that is also no. That means too many of the wrong people are allowed to stay in the forces. Uh, and thirdly, what is a culture of uh, misogyny and sexualized, predatory sometimes behavior towards women like in policing? Uh, and the answer to that is not good at all. Now, Rishi Sunak has conceded that not enough asylum claims have been processed, but he says action is being taken to fix that. Mr Sunak, who's been under pressure to sack his Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, defended her during Prime Minister's questions in the Commons today, saying they're both on the same page when it comes to tackling migration. Labour, meanwhile, have accused the Conservatives of breaking the asylum system. And the Home Secretary is being warned that Kent is at breaking point as a result of the migrant crisis. The leaders of 14 councils have now written to Suella Braverman, advising her of the risk of far-right violence at the overcrowded Manston Processing Centre. And today, a young girl threw a message over the fence, writing about the conditions inside. The note said there were pregnant women and sick detainees, and 50 families had been held there for more than 30 days. Three teenage girls died after systemic failures in NHS mental health care. That's according to an independent investigation. 17-year-olds Nadia Sharif and Christy Harriet, seen here along with 18-year-old Emily Moore, were diagnosed with complex <coughs> mental health needs. They'd all been patients at the West Lane Hospital in Middlesbrough and took their own lives between June 2019 and February 2020. The report says services were unstable and overstretched. 
You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Time now to get back to Dan Wooden tonight. Oh, how bloody pathetic. Liz Truss was finished the moment she U-turned on cutting the 45p top tax rate. The establishment knew her Iron Lady rhetoric was just that and moved within a matter of days to make it impossible for her to stay as Prime Minister. Given Rishi Sunak is in a far stronger position, seeing he actually has the support of most Tory MPs, I'd have hoped he would be prepared to have the courage of his convictions, even if that sometimes means standing up to the woke mob. Sadly, this morning, I was proven wrong. Fishy Rishi has already caved to the craven MSM wits and the blob over what was a bold and brave decision not to attend the COP27 eco doom fest in Egypt, given the crisis back home. When asked about that decision on Friday, this is what Sunak said at the time. We're an example for others to follow at the pace in which we've uh, reduced climate emissions, how we're going about protecting our environment. And those things are really important to me. It's important to me that as Prime Minister, we leave behind an environment that is better for our children and grandchildren. I'm very passionate about that. I'm very personally committed to it. And I just think at the moment, it's right that I'm also focusing on the depressing domestic challenges we have with the economy. And I think that's what people watching would reasonably expect me to be doing as well. But the pressure from all the usual suspects who should be ignored became too much, especially when Sunak's arch-rival, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, confirmed last night he would be making the trip to Egypt. Are you going to go to COP27? Well, yes, as it happens, but um, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's not relevant to Ukraine. But that, I, was, I was invited, I was invited by, by, the, by the Egyptians, so I'm very happy to go. Cue a screeching U-turn from Sunak on, of course, Twitter, where he wrote, There is no long-term prosperity without action on climate change. There is no energy security without investing in renewables. That is why I will attend COP27 next week to deliver on Glasgow's legacy of building a secure and sustainable future. We are now in the midst of government by Twitter, folks, and that's deeply disturbing. I struggle to see how Sunak will have the balls to make the sort of unpopular financial decisions he's threatening if he can't even hold firm on a decision like this. This U-turn was also politically stupid. Ordinary, hard-working Brits had respect for the fact Sunak was going to focus on the dire situation at home in his early weeks in the job, instead of ironically flying off by jet to a doomsday conference where we ordinary folk will be told yet again that driving cars, eating meat and going on holiday should become a thing of a pass. But that wasn't the only Sunak U-turn today. In fact, his team today U-turned on every single one of the leadership pledges he made during the contest against Liz Truss. All of them. All of them gone. So that three-month beauty pageant with heartfelt pledges about cutting taxes and fighting the culture war was a mirage, apparently, that we should now all pretend never happened. Now Sunak is in number 10. It really does feel like democracy is dead following the Ramona globalist coup inside the British government. Everyone keeps pretending this is acceptable because Sunak is a, quote, growing up. But I'd love to know, who is calling the shots? I shudder to think what promises Sunak will now make. Promises that impact all of us, all of our quality of lives for decade to come at COP27 as the deranged march towards net zero continues at pace, whether we like it or not. But to respond now, my superstar panel, former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, the entrepreneur and activist Adam Brooks and the broadcaster Ashley James. Dawn Neeson, what did you make of this COP27 U-turn? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. What a fantastic idea. I'm really impressed. No, 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 no. He needs to grow a pair, doesn't he? It's the most ridiculous thing. I mean, what we need now is we need a Prime Minister here being strong and getting us through the financial mess we face here. What we don't need is him hobnobbing in Sharm El Sheikh 
in winter. It sounds dreadful, doesn't it? Sharma will shake it this time of year. It must be dreadful. I don't know how they can. Oh, yeah. Um, Where yeah. hotels apparently cost thousands and thousands of pounds a night. Know. And how are they getting there? They're not swimming, are they? Um, what, we, what we don't need is him spending the time with the greenwashing, hypocritical idiots out there, many of whom fly in by private jet, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. They did to COP26. Mm -hmm. and, and just sort of like, you're just talking a load about... If hot air coming out of that climate could solve the climate crisis, then it would be sorted out straight away. I mean, it's just... Mm -hmm. It's a waste of time and space. And let's face it, if COP27 was going to work, COP26 should have worked, COP25, 24... None of them worked. Where are we? We're still in climate emergency, code red, we're all going to die next week. So the COP things don't work, do they? So that's a waste of time. Well, the problem time. is, Adam, I even think it's deeper than that. The reason that we are in this current predicament, this economic catastrophe, yes, it's because of lockdowns, uh, yes, it's because of the war in Ukraine, but it's also because of the deranged march towards net zero. Look, it, I'm not a climate change denier. Uh, I'm a realist. There's not a lot that we can do that's going to change whatever trajectory we're on. Unless China and India suddenly change their ways, not a lot that we do in this country is really going to make any, any difference. I'm all for teaching kids to recycle, to do more. I think we all need to improve. But we are not going to change. We, we've... We're pretty good at recycling prime ministers, to be yes, fair. Yes, but look, <laughs> we could collapse humanity in the way that we live and basically go back to the Stone Age and the, and, and the same weather systems and climate mm. will happen. There's not a lot we can do. And I feel like these COP 27s, it's not even a main, a main COP meeting, is it? It's not one of the big important ones. No, there's, ones. A, there's only big ones. Right. Three, five but, but this is the problem now, Adam. You get this pressure. It's, it's government by yeah. Twitter because Twitter decides... Well, he's going to get some lovely... big deal, so he's yeah. got to go. Lovely sound bites, and we're going to get some lovely green agenda lines that can go out, yeah, headlines all over there. Our lives, though. Exactly the that. Work. Look... No, but they don't, because nothing happens. I, I've, got a, I've nothing got a big happens. highlighted thing on my pad here. Voters will hate this. Yeah. And at the end of the day... It's not going to be popular. The silent majority, as Dawn says, is more worried about their bills and, th and their standard yeah. of life but what and their jobs. what pushes our bills up? The sorts of yes, decisions that are made exactly in that. like this. Ashley James, are you happy that Rishi Sunak U-turned today and is getting on the plane to COP27? I think the problem with U-turning is it shows a lack of leadership and it also makes people lose faith in leadership. And actually, whatever I think about climate change, I think he made a valid point. There is lots of go lots going on in the UK. They haven't had a consistent leader. He was that man that was going to bring in stability and accountability. I think what he said was fair enough. And actually, he should have just stood up and be like, do you know what? I would love to be there. And, um, you know, I think it w it's good for him to go because it's his first time on a public stage in front of world leaders, a lot who he hasn't met. So I think it technically could be an important um, place for Great Britain to be represented by their leader. However, he could have just stood up and said, I've, I've, I selected my Minister of, for the Environment, or whatever she's called, Theresa Coffey, and I know that she'll do an outstanding job and I will be there next time and I wish I could be there, but I'm sure everyone will agree there are pressing matters and I'm conscious yeah. that I've only just come into power. And I think people, people, yeah. I think people would have respected him. Until Boris did his interview. Yeah, and this is the thing. He basically is... Yeah. He wants to be there because now Boris is there and we know. But I think the problem is with the U-turns is he wheels out all these ministers to defend his decision... I, the same that Liz trusted, the same that Boris did, and then when they change their mind, it makes these ministers look mm. idiotic. Well, I actually agree with that, Dawn Neeson, because what the issue is here is that it's now shown that Sunak and his number 10 operation are going to have a tiny little bit of criticism from the usual suspects, the pathetic people who dwell on Twitter all day, and he will change his priorities because of them. And that's what's wrong about this. Well, this is the thing. It's, you know, he's governing by Twitter and the Independent Republic of Islington. Yeah. And a few people at the BBC who read The Guardian. Mm. I mean, but it's not about... No. Them, it's about us. But the problem it's about is, all of us. they all live in this little bubble, so they think that's the real world, don't they? And it's not the real world. Of actually. course. Well, let's be honest. It's, Bo it's Boris Johnson is the reason he's going. But I think one thing that is very interesting, because I don't know a lot about the environment, and I'd say I'm quite naive to it, probably because it doesn't impact me. But I recognise that there's situations like Pakistan, also that um, you know this um, the climate crisis does impact refugees, lots of people who live in. Um, 
inhabitable, if that's the right word, um, um, places, obviously, uh, therefore have yeah, to but migrate. But we're, we're moving towards but, very fast than so, G7 country. What more do you want us wait, to do? What, what, what I more think, do you want us to do? What I think is interesting in my research is that one very notable uh, absence is Greta Thunberg. And yeah, she yeah, said, yeah. I'm not going for many reasons, um, but the space for civil society is extremely limited and it's mainly used as an opportunity for leaders and people in power to get attention using many exactly. different types of greenwashing. So if li the literal face of our future and the environment is saying it's a waste of time, I know, Doesn't Thunberg. that mean it's a waste of time? Greta Thunberg, attention seeker. No, no. Who would have Look, I think, I think she's great, and she's a young person who is at least doing something good rather than, I'd say this is a real star going on. What does she know but about anything? If she doesn't Her think hand it's worth are very clever. To, Let's put it that way. Do you know what I found fascinating this week? Uh, I saw some of the BBC presenters talking about meeting uh, Greta Thunberg, and they said they were honoured. They were honoured to meet this odd little teenager, Greta Thunberg. No, I'm sorry. No, I think that's she's, fine. I think she's but great. But it shows a complete lack of impartiality because there's no way that they would say they were honoured to meet an American right-wing commentator. Mm. And can I just be clear? That's all this little girl Thunberg is, right? She's a commentator. She's a, she's a left-wing commentator. She has zero expertise, Ashley. Socialist. I don't parents. think it's fair to compare her to a white right-wing commentator. And actually, well, how she a lot of the things that she is talking what about. She, what's her expertise? And also, what you have to realise. is is that no, for young people, climate, the climate change is a really important yeah, thing. But what it's something Greta that they, Thunberg's expertise? The climate. She's no, no, got no, a lot okay. of people talking about no, no, climate change and environmental What does she know about I presume Greta more than Thunberg me and more than is, you. Is in the same book more than everyone as Candy here. So and she's, she's a commentator, and I think it's utterly pathetic seeing grown adults working for the BBC thinking that they're greeting some sort of messiah... She has zero expertise. I think she's incredibly iconic, and I think it's great to see. And, and let's be honest, the reason she's not going this year is because she wasn't invited. If she wasn't invited last year, she had to go and turn up and stand outside the door last year, so... Mm. That's being a teenager for you. <laughs> and she probably wasn't invited because she has no expertise, does she, Ashley? Well, that would have made her the perfect candidate. She's got an opinion, and she's allowed to express that opinion. I think she does great she things. She has no expertise. I, I do also think it's um, interesting to point out that two-thirds of people in the UK do agree that climate is a big, the biggest issue facing humankind, so it obviously uh, is a driving factor. Who says that? You, Gov. But it, obviously, oh, no, it's Is that YouGov? Oh, they really, um, really, they really get it right, YouGov. It wasn't by YouGov, actually, right, okay. but I know your thoughts on YouGov. <laughs> um, but I understand that, you know, for lots of people, it, it is something that they um, think is something that is important. However, I also think people were very understanding of Rishi Sunak's reasons for not going, and I think the, it's mainly the youth well, and that just that makes now. him look weak. He, he's blowing that now. Ashley James, Adam Brooks, Dawn Neese at my superstar panel, and they are with me all evening. But also still to come, the King of the North, Tory MP Lee Anderson, who's fought off cancellation for his common sense takes and everything from Eddie Izzard to the migrant crisis joins me live. He certainly won't be holding back from 9.40. But first, as he defends his controversial decision, do you believe Matt Hancock's claim that he wasn't motivated by the moolah, the £350,000 to a fair and I'm a celebrity? My lineup of jungle veterans, former Lib Dem MP Lembic Opic, broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton, and the TV cleaning guru Kim Woodburn will clash next. But it's your opinion that matters most to me, of course. Email me down at tvnews.uk, tweet me using the handle at tvnews, a poll running there too. The results and the clash coming up straight after the break. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akua, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. On The Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. And it's time now for The Clash. Now, unless you've been living under a spider-covered rock, you'll know that Matt Hancock will soon be living under a spider-covered rock after joining this year's I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. Defending his controversial decision, which has drawn condemnation from fellow MPs and COVID-bereaved families and seen him suspended from the Conservative Party, or at least the whip suspended from him, the former Health Secretary insisted the show would offer a different way to connect with the electorate. Writing in The Sun, Hancock also claimed the rumoured £350,000 fee was not a factor in him agreeing to come on the show after rejecting two offers in the summer. He insisted he will be donating an undisclosed amount to a Suffolk hospice and causes supporting dyslexia and disclose his paycheck to Parliament. Do you really believe that money wasn't a factor in Hancock heading into the jungle? Let me know your thoughts by emailing me at dan at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at gbnews. Our poll is running there too. The results coming up shortly. But joining me now... A wild lineup of former I'm a Celebrity stars. Former Lib Dem MP Lembic Opik, who finished 11th in the 2010 series of I'm a Celebrity. The broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton, who came third in the first ever edition in 2002. And TV cleaning darling Kim Woodburn, runner up in 2009. And they join me all now. So, Christine Hamilton, this is about the money, isn't it? Christine, are you there? It pisses me off that Boris is... OK, we're just going to wait to get Christine, but I'm sorry. £350,000 and this bloke claims it's about the money. Christine, as if! Pisses me off. Yeah, well, have I been unmuted? You've been unmuted. Have we can I hear you now, Christine. We can hear you loud well, and clear. I'm, I'm, look. Who knows what his motivation is, and frankly, I don't care. He shouldn't be doing it anyway. But if his motivation is not money, there's a very easy way to prove it. Give all that money away. The very least he should do is give away his parliamentary salary. He's very, very well remunerated. 
by the taxpayer to do his job, which is a member of parliament, not to swan off to the sunshine in Australia. So it's, you know, he says he wants to talk about dyslexia. Does he honestly think that ITV are going to give prime time television to his views on dyslexia? No, they're going to be giving prime time to him looking a complete prat doing his trials and tribulations. I mean, Limbeck Opic, how do you defend this? Because Hancock is now a serving MP. He should be looking after his West Suffolk constituents. When you went on I'm a Celebrity Olympic, you had left Parliament. So that's fine. You can do what you want. East and Tiger. I'm not going to hide behind that. I would have gone into, into the uh, jungle even if I had been an MP. And Christine, come on. Do you really think that uh, politics should be all about the po-faced greyness of politics, which has caused us all the troubles that we've got? Sometimes we have to cross-fertilise between politics and what I've described, the real world. And you could say that, uh, in a sense, the, uh, the reality shows are not the real world, but which is more real? Being in the jungle or being in the strangest bar in Parliament. Okay, so Limbeck, what, no, but Limbeck, what if there is a serious incident in West Suffolk over the next three weeks? What the heck are his constituents meant to do? He's going to be in the Australian jungle, downing kangaroo testicles and unable to be contacted. OK, first of all, it doesn't matter what he eats. Um, I actually like liver and faggots, but uh, I don't get blamed for doing that. He's got a break clause, my friend. You can actually leave Parliament, sorry, not leave Parliament, leave the jungle if there's a problem there. But there's a more fundamental point here. Most politicians, and he knows this, uh, work 330 days, 350 days a year. If you want to damn uh, Matt Hancock for what he's done, then give them their weekends back, 104 days a year. He's taking at most 23 days if he wins. He's not going to win. Uh, but if he did, then 23 days. Uh, so I actually think this is just another virtue signalling attempt, a woke attempt at damning politicians. And Christine, okay, well, you wouldn't go in there. You wouldn't go in there if this was the uh, the atmosphere uh, now. Okay. Well, let's let Kim Woodburn come in. Kim, who do you agree with, Christine or Lembeck? I don't think he should be going in the jungle at all. I mean, Why? He's, his constituency is West Suffolk. Mm -hmm. They're going through a hell of a time right now. Mm -hmm. um, they want to cancel all the bus routes there. They're being, um, you know, resourced, and it's going to cripple West Suffolk. Also, the farmers are risking having lots of their land taken off them in a compulsory deal so they can have this uh, solar situation, like 2,500 acres and they want to take the farmer's land off them, compulsory purchase. He's got a lot to be dealing with that fitting into the jungle. It's ridiculous. And I don't like the way suddenly he's 44 years of age and suddenly we're all hearing dyslexia. My love, dyslexia is a sad illness. Bless, I haven't got it, but we know, it, we know it's bad. Mm -hmm. The man has a degree from Oxford and Cambridge. One of them was in politics, God knows how. The only history thing he's got, he's in the House of Commons, my love, mm. having a lustful few, few minutes with his bit of fluff. Mm. He's filmed in the House of Commons. He's got his right hand firmly gripped on yeah. her backside, pulling her bum in. He's got his tongue, it wasn't just a little kissy, his tongue was mm. down her throat. Yeah. And he's filmed, a, 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 just a minute, he, a member of Parliament, he's trash. Yeah. You don't need that, yeah. dear. When, when, Limbeck, when Limbeck, he was telling all of us that we had to social distance and he was breaking all of his own rules, Limbeck. I mean, you have to admit, this is not a normal politician. This is a politician who played with our human rights, Limbeck. And I just feel the fact that he's doing something like this is so crass. Yes, yes, well, yes. Sure. I don't know whether you noticed, folks. Kim, just let Limbeck, just Limbeck come in, Kim. Right, I agree with three of the four things you said there. Um, first of all, he broke the Kim, just let Lambert respond and then you can come back in. And Richard Sunak raced straight past him. He snubbed him. No, I know. I love that. I love that. OK, Kim, we've heard from you. We'll come back to you in a moment, but just let Lambert come in. Politically, let me save time here. We can all agree he was 
very flawed as a hypocrite when it came to uh, Secretary of State for the Health uh, Service. Completely unjustifiable. He lost his job. But there are two questions here. Is he a good cabinet minister? No, he resigned. Do people, you're all shaking your heads. We all agree that. The second question is, can politicians have second jobs? Because this is no worse than being a barrister or a lawyer and doing side jobs like Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson, who made a fortune out of writing and everything else. So as far as I'm concerned, the only difference here, here is that people hate uh, Matt Hancock. Give the man a break. He's chosen a celebrity career as a sideline instead of being a barrister. And whenever you have your righteous indignation, I just simply don't accept it. Christine, how he does. Christine, how do you respond to that? I'm astonished. Give the man a break. What about giving a break to the people that he screwed down during COVID? What about giving a break to the people whose loved ones died during COVID because of his determination to lock us all down? And by the way, he's very familiar with hidden cameras, so he will be at home in the jungle. But I am. It's not the same as somebody who's he's he's gone thousands of miles away to the other side of the world when this country is in a hell of a mess. We've got autumn statements coming up, and Kim has is, uh, listed issues in his own constituency. His job is to be either at Westminster or in his constituency, looking after his patchwork. That is what he's paid to do. He is not paid to mess around in the jungle. He is not. Say that, Christine. Basically, it's his constituents. You're not one of his constituents. It's his constituents. I'm entitled to an opinion. Yeah, and you're entitled to your opinion, yes. But when it comes down to it, Nadine Doris went into the jungle and went on to be a cabinet minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That suggested that not only did his, her constituents agree that she was in the jungle with justifiable Well, I guess response. she wasn't one of the most reviled politicians in the land. And the problem here, Kim, is that I think, Kim, because he is an adulterer, as you might say, he's using this to try and make us like him again, Kim. And we're not going to like him again, Kim, after what he did to us during COVID. We will not forget that. You, you know how I feel about this, and I'm sorry, folks, I might bore you, but I won't change. He's having an affair with his bit of fluff Mm -hmm. He's married with three children who must be quite old. He's 42 when this happened. His wife finds out, she doesn't know it's going on. She finds out from the newspapers and a yeah. photograph of him touching her bum. Oh. Now, I have a thing. If you don't want to stay married to who you're married to, please, I urge you to say, I'm not in love with you. I want to leave. Then do what the hell you like. But when you're going home to that woman and your three children and you're shagging your secretary morning, noon and nights. And what has that got to do with what we're discussing? You are absolutely out of order. I don't think that you've got any well, right. Well, Limbic, he was telling us that we should all be social distance and that we shouldn't be having sex with anyone, and then he was getting off with someone in a public office. I think it has everything to do with his reputation, actually. I respect his wife the right. He's got the right. Let me see that photograph in the paper of him clutching her bum and tongue down her throat must have broken those children's hearts. What do you mean I've got... What's wrong with you? Are you an adulterer by any chance? Stand up. I, I, I think you'll find that if you said no adulterer could go into any reality television, there wouldn't be many people. There probably be. Yeah. I'm not going to comment on the people who yeah. are in there now. But it's As the circumstances, Christine. It was the circumstances of where yeah. and how the adultery happened. It happened at a time that he and wanted I to tell us who we could sleep with, Christine. I am absolutely not defending his behaviour at all, but it is not because he is an adulterer that I think he shouldn't be in the jungle. It is because of all that. Exactly, yeah. you're absolutely right. When he was telling us that we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that, he yeah. shouldn't be yeah. in the jungle. He made the his private life the issue, but I absolutely agree. The fundamental reason yeah. he shouldn't be in the jungle is because he is a serving MP who made disgraceful decisions during the COVID pandemic. I just want that man to say, I read the column, Christine, you in the column today, I, mean, I, I, I was nearly sick. He's only going in to help people that have got dyslexia. 
He's going in. Well, that just cost a, a shower in. screen. He doesn't shower want cut. the money. I'm giving some of it away. Give it all away, and I'll believe you're genuine. Yeah. Oh, he's not giving it all away. I couldn't agree more. Wow, what a brilliant lineup of former I'm a Celebrity contestants. The former Lib Dem MP, Lim Kofik, the broadcaster and author, Christine Hamilton, and the it's TV cleaning crew. Coming for you. I'm coming to you. I'm an, I'm an idiot. Let me back home. Oh, my goodness. So who do you agree with? Love you all. Uh, Lama on Twitter says he's always been motivated by money, like most MPs now who prefer self service to public service. He's also one of the most heinous evil scumbags to inhabit Parliament and should be facing a criminal trial instead of a Bush Tucker one. Steve on Twitter says he's got a divorce coming up. Of course it's money motivated, should have kept it in his trousers. And Andrew on Twitter says, I blame ITV. They shouldn't offer him a place on the show when he already has a full-time job as a Member of Parliament. And your verdict is now in. 12% of you agree that he is motivated. Oh, sorry, I, I, what, what, I don't understand that. 12% of money say that he isn't motivated by money. I thought that's right. 88% of you say that he is. All right, there you go. Coming up, should royalists peacefully protest against Harry for promoting his disgraceful book in the UK? Tonight's outside of political firebrand Anne Whittakin thinks so. She joins me at 9.50. But next, King of the North and Tory MP Lee Anderson tackles the migrant crisis. Eddie is out and more woke attacks on Churchill with a frankness you won't see elsewhere in Westminster. The politician of the people joins me live after the break. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News.
We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Welcome back, outspoken Conservative MP and now King of the North, Lee Anderson joins me now. Now, Lee, uh, the Met Police have confirmed that no offences have been identified regarding your recent comments about the comedian and possible Labour candidate for Sheffield, Eddie Izzard. Of course, people like yourself and Rosie Duffield have questioned Izzard's bid to get on the ballot paper and fears he could be running on an all-woman shortlist. Well, I know you haven't seen this yet, but Izzard has actually responded to what you had to say, so have a look at this. Um, I've campaigned as an activist since 2008. I've been out for almost four decades now. So, you know, some people aren't up to speed. If some people haven't joined the 21st century, well, they've got to get on the bus. So, Lee, Izzard says you need to get into the real world, the world well, today. The real world. I'm from the real world, Dan, uh, in a place called Ashfield. I, I was a coal miner for many years, following my dad my granddad and my great granddad into the pits. These were all Labour voters, Labour supporters. A lot of the Labour MPs back in the day were drawn from the trade unionists, from, from, the, from the, uh, the coal miners, the steel workers, the factory workers. Fast forward 40, 50 years, that's what we're looking at um, in the Labour Party. That's what might be coming to Parliament, I hope not, uh, in, in a few years' time. Look, and some of the old Labour voters I talk to back in the real world in Ashford, have a look at that and think, you know, my goodness, what's it coming to? Well, it was really interesting. Paul Embry, who's, of course, a Labour Party member, a regular contributor to GB News, said, you know, hang on a moment, all of... Uh, and he's a Labour member, of yeah, course. Yeah. All of the members who are getting excited saying this is going to be a romp for Starmer. Actually, on these social issues, on the trans issue, yeah. on, on the fact that you've got a leader who can't even say whether a woman can have a penis or not, that could be what actually defeats Labour. Well, let's, let's just put this into context, Dan. I knock on lots of doors, speak to lots of people in Ashfield, and I can tell you 100%, hand on my heart, this never comes up on the doorstep. People are not talking about it. I tell you who are talking about it, the people in the Westminster bubble, mm. the media and some left-wing lunatics who, who contact me on not, not too regular basis, but they do. They, 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 they come into my inbox making all sorts of ridiculous claims. Mm. Nobody in the real world is actually talking about this nonsense. And let's be honest, Lee, no, no one in the real world really believes that Eddie Izzard is a woman, do they? Well, look, Eddie Izzard, I was talking to a colleague today at work who shall remain nameless, who saw Eddie Izzard in a play about 20 years ago where he appeared completely naked. And she said to me, he's definitely a man. <laughs> now, you've gone viral twice this week. Also for this moment, uh, in the house with Suala Braverman. Let's have a look. This was the moment in the house with Suella Braverman where you offered her quite a lot of support. Uh, we'll try and get it in just a moment. But, but the migrant crisis issue and the fact that uh, Suella used the term invasion again, for me, this is proof that she is actually in the real world. What did you make of the pearl clutching going on from the blob and most of the MSC? No, it's, it's absolute nonsense. It is an invasion. Look, I've been banging on about this in the house for the past 18 months. I feel like a bit of a weirdo sometimes to keep banging on about it, but actually now some of my colleagues are looking up. You know, we're seeing hotels filling up across the country. It's affecting colleagues, constituencies, and now they're taking, starting to take notice. Two hours bang on. She's saying all the right things. I just hope that Cabinet number 10 and the whole, whole of Parliament get behind her because she, she means business, we mean business, but unfortunately, um, like I said before, Dan, we, we, we work in a bubble, the Westminster bubble, and they don't take it too seriously. I'll tell you what would help if some of the MPs that's got second homes in and around this place, if the, if the removal men turn up tomorrow and turf them out and put some of these Albanians in, in, in their houses tomorrow, then maybe they'll, they'll get behind her. Well, look, we've got that moment now, Lee, so let's have a look. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Now then, we've we got Albanian criminals leaving Albania, which is a safe country. Right. The same criminals are then setting up shop in France. 
They're then leaving France, which is a safe country, and coming to the UK across the channel. And then when they get into accommodation, we've got the opposition parties saying the accommodation is not good enough for them. Yeah. Well, does the Home Secretary agree with me? If the, if the accommodation is not good enough for them, they can get on a dinghy and go straight back to France. Yeah. 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 Take a break. Well, my honourable friend's right. The average cost per night is £150 per person per night, to per night in a hotel. By my standards, that's quite a nice hotel. I mean, people can't believe, Lee, that we're spending £6.8 million a day mm -hmm. on these hotels. We're telling people to tighten the belts, you know, we've got a cost of living crisis, you know, we're probably going to have a difficult winter with people struggling to pay the fuel bills, yet we're letting these people in, into our country, our great country. It's costing, it's not just £6, £7 million a, a day, Dan, it's a lot more than that. We're seeing now that you know, hotels, they're brimming, people are having their weddings cancelled, there's a massive opportunity cost here throughout the country. And I tell you what, back in the real world, I'll, I'll keep banging on about the real world, people are absolutely furious. And, and the people where I work are let, letting, letting the great country down. Well, this is the number one issue. Massively. And I think Sunak has to give his full throttle back into Braverman or Superwoman Suella, as I call yeah. her, because actually, that's the only chance you guys have, I think, to win the well, next election if you stop the boats. Because we know Labour's policy is going to be one of open borders. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the alternative <coughs> is even worse. But people are not seeing that at the moment. No. They're very angry with us. No, they see these young men, you know, uh, from 18 to 35 arriving on our shores every day. Some are just running off. You know, if they're running off, they're not genuine asylum seekers. You know, the, the whole system's broken. We've tried to fix it. We need to be tougher, a lot tougher, Dan. Indeed. Now, look, uh, Lee, unbelievably, the left's favourite whipping boy, our favourite Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, has had a 1941 letter he wrote to President Roosevelt <coughs> slapped with a woke warning. So in the letter, Churchill described the German enemy as Huns, and new research from the National Archives brings attention to the, quote, derogatory word. So, essentially, Lee, we're now in a world where official British organisations want to put trigger warnings on the words of Winston Churchill. We have to stand up against this Of course, this stuff, I mean, the, the, the sad thing is, Dan, that these people actually walk amongst us. It, it's absolutely shocking. Look, 50 million people, I think, died in the Second World War, millions more in the First World War. Do we actually think that their relatives, their descendants, are actually bothered about the word horn? I'm certainly not. And, and like I say again, back in the real world, normal people aren't. These people are, are probably paid by taxpayers. They, they're, they're a drain on society. They need to grow up and get a proper job. Now, in the real world, Lee, uh, the status of MPs has taken another hit this week. Yes. Because of that snake, uh, Matt Hancock, saying to hell with the constituents of West Suffolk, I'm going to go and earn £350,000 by eating kangaroo balls in the Australian jungle. What, what did you make of his decision? Because he's had the Tory whip suspended, of course. Well, removing the whip's the right decision. I think it's shocking. It, um, it just... You know, for us new MPs, I've been an MP for nearly three years, it just puts, puts us in a funny position because people are, thinking, people are thinking to themselves, what do MPs actually do? And a lot of MPs work very, very hard, and he's, he's sort of just cast that aside. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's shocking. If he is earning the 350 grand, which, which I'm hearing at the moment, he should give it away. He says it's not for the money. Prove it, Matt. Give it give all that, away. Give it all away. But he won't. He's giving a tiny portion to a local charity. Yeah. He will not give it all away. It's absolutely so, rubbish. So, so there's no way back for him now in the Tory party? I don't see how there is. I mean, that's up to the, the, the party itself. But, you know, to go away when his constituency needs him, when his people in, in, in the area lives need him, for 350 grand, come on, Dan. What does that say about our profession? It's a disgrace. It's an disgrace. absolute disgrace. Our King of the North, Lee Anderson. Thank you, Lee. We will speak next week. But coming up, amid fears such a move would break international law, do you support government plans to deport illegal migrants within days of their arrival in Britain? And does Starmer's record on immigration suggest the invasion will become a flood under Labour? My superstar panel returns to debate that after 10. Plus, we're going to have the first newspaper front pages arriving then too. But first, should royalists peacefully protest against Prince Harry for promoting his disgraceful new book in the UK? Political firebrand tonight's outsider Anne Whittacombe pleads that case straight after the break.
We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Akvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Time now for The Outsider. Now, the revelation that Prince Harry may return to the UK to promote his hideous me, me, me memoir, Spare, which is expected to drag his whole family through the dirt, has been met with outrage over here, especially from our very own Anne Widdicombe. Taking fire in her latest Express column, which she normally tries to keep a Sussex-free zone, the political firebrand writes, what's the betting he stays at Frogmore Cottage while trashing his family? OK. We can show him what we think about that. Everywhere he goes, he should be greeted with shouts of God save the king or God bless the Prince of Wales. No need for ill-mannered booing or rude placards or custard pies dripping down his beard. Just a display of solidarity behind the royal family. And Widdy joins me now. And so this is really important, isn't it? There are ways that monarchists can express an outrage uh, at Prince Harry. I I guess, a bit of civil resistance in a respectful manner, you say? Well, yes, I think one can combine dignity with disgust. 
quite honestly. You know, and a lot of us are deeply disgusted with all this whinging and whining and moaning and groaning that pours forth uh, from the mansion in Montecito. Uh, and uh, if he is coming here, as apparently he is, to promote his book, I mean, what a cheat. Uh, if he's going to do that, then I think everywhere he goes, he should hear shouts of God save the king. Now, I'm not urging people to come out in their hundreds onto the streets or anything like that. As you know, that's not quite my style. But where he happens to be, uh, anybody who happens to see him should shout God save the king or even God bless the Prince of Wales. Indeed, don't shout, because... go home, Harry, don't but... shout any ruderings, just display loyalty to the royal family, a loyalty that he's lost. But, Anne, it is disgusting what he's doing, isn't it? And I thought it was a really good point that you make. He's going to come here, stay in a grace and favour mansion. You know, it's called Frogmore Cottage, but this is a mansion, which is a sign of the luxurious life of complete decadence that has been provided to Prince Harry in part by his blood role, but also in part by his father, the father who he is trashing, Anne, from the greatest of heights before he's even had a chance to have his coronation. I mean, I really worry now, Anne, that Prince Harry actually wants to bring down Charles's reign, the reign of Charles III. This is how bitter he is. I don't know that he wants to bring down Charles III, but I think he, Harry, certainly wants to be the centre of attention. He certainly wants to make an awful lot of money. He whinged to uh, Oprah that uh, Daddy didn't keep him anymore. He didn't use those words, but he said his father had cut him off financially. This is a man in his 30s. You're supposed to be keeping yourself in your 30s, Harry. Uh, and he wants all the privileges of being royal without actually the duties of being royal. That's what this comes down to. Uh, and, you know, I, I think when they first departed, there was a certain amount of sympathy for them, but their behaviour since has just forfeited that. I know, and Anne, uh, the thing that is so pathetic is that he's still trading off his royal status. You know, he's still <laughs> describing himself as Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. And actually, there's a real tragedy, isn't there, that the only way this bloke can make money is by slagging off the institution, which is why he's in such an amazing position in life. Uh, that is perfectly true. I mean, the fact is, if you look at both of them, and as I say in my Express column, very good column every Wednesday, by the way. Very, very uh, good. As I say, uh, Meghan um, wanted to be an A-list celebrity. What was she? She was an actor in a TV drama, and that was it. That's as far as she'd risen. She wants the lifestyle of an A-list celebrity. Got to be paid for. Harry wants the lifestyle of a royal without actually doing the royal duties that bring in uh, the royal uh, finances. So what's he got to do? He's got to make money. How can they make money? The only way they can do it is by selling the one asset that they've got between them, which is Harry's connection. Uh, with the royal family. But there is a shelf life to it. I mean, there'll come a time when the story is told, when there are no more revelations to be made, when nobody wants to buy the books because there's nothing in them. Um, what's he going to do then? What's he going to do then? Indeed, it is certainly going to be a case of diminishing returns, but from everything I'm told, Anne, that's why they want the big bucks now, because they have to ensure that by the time they're 50, they never have to go cap and hand to King Charles or potentially in the future King William, because you know they will be sending them back to Montecito. Anne Whittacombe, thank you so much, Anne. We'll speak next week. And they could always try working, Dan. They could always try working. They don't want to do that. <laughs>It's 10pm, I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, the battle to take back control of the channel exploded in the Commons today, with Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer going head-to-head -head over the migrant crisis. What, what did we on this side of the House do? We gave the British people a referendum on Brexit. No one wants open borders on this side of the House. They've lost control of the borders on their side of the House. Sunak elects to appease the green mob in a worrying U-turn. Does his attendance at COP27 show political weakness? And is he just trying to keep up with his political nemesis, Boris Johnson? Well, father to the former PM and conservationist Stanley Johnson weighs in live at 10.20.
As one of football's wokest men, Gareth Southgate, says this about the brutal and bloody construction of Qatar's World Cup stadiums. We met with lots of the, um, the workers out there and they are united in it's certainly one thing, that's that they want the tournament to happen. Yet yeah, there are the workers, Gareth, who uh, didn't die building the damn stadiums that you're going to be playing in. So is switching off the tournament now the only way to send a message to the virtue signalling hypocrites of the England team? Columnist extraordinaire Rod Little uncancelled on that at 10.45. And as a uni professor who promoted COVID authoritarianism like this goes viral after calling for a COVID amnesty. We're unvaccinated. We are looking at a winter of severe illness and death. Those who haven't had jabs but could have jabs need to have a badge saying unjab. So should we really forgive the pandemic hysterics who waged war on our civil liberties? We'll thrash that out in the media buzz at 10.30. Stay tuned for the first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages too and the coronation of tonight's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass too. But before all of that, the news headlines at 10 with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you, and good evening to you. The top story on GB News tonight, two Metropolitan Police officers have been sentenced to three months in prison for sending grossly offensive messages with Wayne Cousins before he murdered Sarah Everard. And a warning, the following pictures contain flash photography if you're watching on TV. PC Jonathan Cobbin and former PC Joel Borders shared messages of a racist, homophobic and misogynistic nature in a WhatsApp group in 2019. The pair have been bailed ahead of an appeal against their convictions at the High Court. Well, the Prime Minister has been urging police chiefs to take action to change the culture within the police force after a new report found serious failures in vetting officers and staff. After examining eight forces, the police watchdog found officers who'd previously been convicted of domestic abuse or accused of sexual assault were taken on and employed. It says it found a common culture of misogyny, sexism and predatory behaviour towards female police officers. The Home Secretary is being warned that Kent is at breaking point as a result of the migrant crisis. The leaders of 14 councils wrote to Suella Braverman advising her of the risk of far-right violence at the overcrowded Manston Processing Centre there. And today, a young girl threw a message over the fence of the facility, writing about the conditions inside. The note said there were pregnant women and sick detainees, and 50 families, she said, had been held there for more than 30 days. Three teenage girls died after systemic failures in NHS mental health care, an independent investigation has found. 17-year-olds Nadia Sharif and Christy Harnett, seen here along with 18-year-old Emily Moore, were diagnosed with complex mental health disorders. They'd all been patients at the West Lane Hospital in Middlesbrough and the girls took their own lives between June 2019 and February 2020. The report says services were unstable and overstretched. A Florida school mass shooter who murdered 17 students and staff has been sentenced to life in prison. Nicholas Cruz, who was 19 at the time, used a semi-automatic rifle in the attack on the Parkland School in February 2018. The now 24-year-old was spared the death penalty after pleading guilty to premeditated murder. <laughs> A number of victims' relatives addressed the court before sentencing, describing Cruz as pure evil and a domestic terrorist. You're up to date on TV online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Time now to go back to Dan Wooden tonight. <laughs> So, time for tomorrow's news tonight now in our Media Buzz. First front pages are with me. That's our boy is the Metro headline alongside a picture of an Albanian man stopping a coach from leaving the Manston immigration facility because his nephew was reportedly among the migrants on board. Home office leaves coach of migrants at train station and major error is the headline of the eye after dozens of migrants were reportedly dropped off at Victoria Station following their evacuation from the Manston Centre in Kent. 
The Daily Star launches a campaign for Britain to vote for him to do all the challenges. They're obviously talking about uh, Matt Hancock there. Keep on kicking him in the ballots until the creep crawls home. And, of course, they call Matt Hancock Coco. My superstar panel, back with me now, former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, the entrepreneur and activist Adam Brooks and the broadcaster Ashley James. Now, in the latest developments on that massive migrant crisis, the Albanian Prime Minister Edi Rama has intervened, writing on Twitter that, quote, the UK should stop discriminating against Albanians to excuse policy failures. This follows new plans from ministers to deport illegal migrants within days of their arrival in Britain, denying them opportunity to appeal rejected asylum claims. Now, currently, the UK's slow and ineffective asylum process means arrivals are being put up in hotels at the exorbitant cost of nearly £7 million a day. However, lawyers have warned that removing migrants without the chance of appeal would break international law. We've heard that before, haven't we? So maybe this could be another policy that fails to get off the ground. But today at PMQ's, Rishi Sunak insisted that they remain the party committed to tackling illegal immigration. What, what did we on this side of the House do? We gave the British people a referendum on Brexit. Yes. We, we, delivered, we delivered Brexit. We ended the free movement of people, Mr Speaker. That's our record on migration policy. It's not something the Honourable Gentleman supported. He opposed it at every turn, and it's not what the British people want. No-one wants open borders on this side of the House. They've lost control of borders on their side of the House. So, Dawn, it looks like, yet again, a plan to try and speed up this process and be able to send criminals who aren't meant to be here back to Albania could be thwarted by these international human rights laws. Well, we're going to have to sort something out, aren't we? And I can't believe we are still talking about it now after all these years. I mean, you know, 75% of this country's brothels and operations in London, worth £15 million alone, are run by Albanian yep. gangs. So, and, and they, they are yep. sort of like, you know, back in, I think... And there are so many facts like that, aren't there? Absolutely. And two years ago, 8,000 migrants came across the channel. Iran, Afghanistan and Syria were the places they were coming from. And now we know that four mm. in ten of those crossing the channel are young, fit men from Albania. Yeah. If I was the president of Albania, I'd be asking why one to 2% here, this population of young, fit men are all trying to come over here. I mm. want... Well, they're already here. Oh, exactly. 2% two, of the adult male population... Yeah, absolutely. ...already and, here, which and is we'll extraordinary. And remember, Adam, they are coming from France. Mm. They are not coming from a third-world country, wherever these yeah. people are from. Look... <laughs> The, the left today, many of the left today are, are quoting James O'Brien, who's done this speech on LBC. Who? Uh, that guy. Um, you know, and think that they've got some one-up in this argument. At the end of the day, applications might be lower than other countries, but we have got around 1.5 million undocumented and unknown illegal immigrants in this country, which is three times the amount of France. OK? Now... We cannot keep allowing people to come into this country when our services and, our, you know, our, our society is stretched as it is, you know. And, you know, this argument that um, these numbers are tiny, these numbers might be tiny per week, but at the end of the year, they're huge. Mm. And year after year after year, we can end up with another million. Mm. Well, um, where do we stop? How many millions are acceptable when we've got 7 million people waiting for NHS operation? Exactly that. You know, asylum claims are soaring, apparently, according to The Guardian. That's The Guardian that, uh, that said that. You can search that online. But deportations are the lowest on record. So we're doing nothing about it. People are coming in, even if they're not being accepted, they're disappearing into the system. You know, there's numerous articles online about people going missing from these, uh, these processing centres. Why are they going missing, Dan, mm. if they feel like that they're going to get something at the end of it? They're going missing because they're going to game our system and game our economy, and yeah. it has to stop. Ashley, James, how do you justify the fact that by the end of the year we might have 50,000 undocumented illegal migrants here? Yeah, I, I'm not going to justify it. I think... Um... It's complete policy failure by the Conservatives, and they can point finger and scaremonger and say, "Imagine if Labour were in." But we've had the Conservatives for 12 years, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And it is an 
absolutely horrific statistic that they've only processed 4% of asylum seekers. The Home Office itself says that applicants should re receive a decision within six months. So the reason we have all this overcrowding and all this problem, like none of us, no matter what side you sit on, I've got two friends who own separate refugee charities and I hear a lot of the very real and genuine cases. Nobody wants people sat in an asylum centre unable waiting for a process, waiting for their asylum to be either accepted or denied. The people in those systems don't want that. They want to work, they want to go on with their lives. A lot of the genuine victims of sex trafficking, war, um, they want to carry on. They're in these horrible, unsafe environments. We have lots of people abusing the system. No one is denying that on any side. And the government are doing absolutely nothing. But I think it's important, though, to talk about Starmer, because he is trying to present the fact that, as a Labour leader in government, he would somehow be able to solve this problem. Well, actually, it's been revealed that in 2015, when he was the shadow immigration minister working for Jeremy Corbyn, remember the man that he thought would be a great prime minister, Starmer wanted Corbyn as prime minister, I never forget that. Actually, he did lots of things uh, to try and thwart efforts to stop boats crossing the channel. Um, in including, by the way, trying to change the law so channel migrants with a fear of return could qualify for asylum, and also trying to change the law to ensure small boats arriving in UK waters could not be pushed back at sea. So that's the policy prescription we have from Starmer, the absolute opposite, actually, of stopping the boats. Well, he hasn't said he wants an open immigration policy. He's actually Sounds said the like opposite. It, though, no, he, his he's, he's, he's rhetoric. He's rhetoric. But he's, he is being very cautious about what he is saying. But what I will also say is that he does have a lot of experience in pursuing the criminals of these gangs. And nobody wants to go on these boats, especially not real victims of trafficking. And it no, is... Because real it, victims of trafficking aren't on those boats, because real victims lot, of Lots of, of them are. Sex trafficking that you mentioned are women. They are female victims. They're not women and on those 80 boats, And 86% of Albanian women, because I think it's really important to bring up Albania because we keep generalising, and, yes, I agree, the majority of people um, should not be allowed and, therefore, they should go through the asylum process, which should be processed quicker, and then they should be deported. But there are, as you mentioned, issues with brothels. 86% of Albanians, female Albanians, um, receive positive decisions on asylum because they are victims they're of sex trafficking. They're not the ones on the boats, no. actually. And, 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 and oh. actually, but there are people have, on no, the no, boats. Actually, we have to talk about the numbers because you want to stick to the facts, so let's talk about the numbers. 90% of the people arriving in small boats are men. Three quarters are aged between 18 to 39. In other words, these are undocumented economic migrants largely coming uh, from Albania, largely to enter criminal systems, prostitution rings, drug rings and terrorism in this country. We have to stop it. Yeah, we need to start processing them quicker to get the bad ones out. It's also worth mentioning lots of from Afghanistan. We are responsible for the absolutely shambolic evacuation. No, but everyone coming in the small boat is already in France. So anyone who has France, a genuine France claim to asylum is already in, in a first world country. Yeah, but in a hostile environment. We, in, in you think 20, France is a hostile environment? The way they you? treat immigration, and they have a huge immigration crisis as well. They're part of the EU. They, I thought the EU was fantastic. No, of course, but there is a, there is a huge. I mean, we saw in the news like um, you're saying France is a hostile news, country. Refugees being found naked on the Greek you're, border. You're... We know there are problems, and I, as I mentioned, so we're better I have, out. Aren't I we? have we're friends, better out of that. I have friends who own refugee charities. They they know um, an Afghan woman who's a midwife. She's been waiting for months to have her asylum. Loads of these genuine asylum seekers. They want to work. And, and they do, France, and they're caught up France in their accepted 127,000, whereas we only accepted 48,000 in 2021. France is twice the size of this country. Okay, France, well, if you want to go that far, like that, the one percentage and a half per 10,000 um, of people, we we are not even in the top 10. So it's a lie because to say the, that we are the, accepting the, the, higher. Well, look, I'm, I'm just going to bring you the Daily Express front page quickly because on this note, they are leading with an exclusive tomorrow that the Home Secretary, Superwoman Suella, is actually eyeing up three more countries to send channel migrants in a bid to solve the crisis. Paraguay, Peru and Belize, all in South America, are on the table as potential alternatives to Rwanda. 
The government's most advanced talks are with Paraguay, according to the newspaper. Another unnamed African country is also in the mix, according to unnamed sources quoted by the paper. So to me, Dawn Neeson, this shows Superwoman Suala, she means business. But the problem is... All of the human rights lawyers, uh, the lefty campaigns, is... they will continue to use the ECHR. So we have to leave the ECHR if we want to sort this I, I out. Think, I think that's the only way it's going to work. Because no matter what countries we're being discussed here, I mean, mm. the human rights yeah. lawyers are still going to get involved no matter where we're thinking of sending them. Yeah. So because we, we have bound to... by international law to accept refugees and therefore we need to allow yeah. people but to actually, go through we, the we, asylum we, but actually, system. actually, as we've just made the point, the vast majority of these folk are, are not genuine that's, refugees. That's not they're accurate. already it is accurate. accurate. They are economic migrants. Again, Dan, I've got to say it again. For, we have got 1.5 million undocumented illegal yeah, immigrants and nobody wants in this that. country. That's because of France has got half a million. Failure. It's not because of the people coming over. So we've over. got three times okay. the amount that France has got. Well, look, people. we will obviously continue this conversation in the days to come, but I want to show you ways to eco-terrorists now. And if, if the mob in this country think they've been getting a hard time from motorists, then they should see what happens to their Italian counterparts when they whine in the middle of a road. So raging drivers near Rome took matters into their own hands with brute force when motorways blocked by Extinction Rebellion Italia took place on the morning commute. <laughs> And would you look at that? The traffic started moving again without a police officer in sight. I love it. Well done to the Italians. Ashley James, Adam Brooks, Dawn Neeson, do stand by because coming up, as a uni professor who promoted COVID authoritarianism goes viral after calling for a COVID amnesty, should we forgive pandemic hysterics who waged war on civil liberties? A superstar panel uh, returns for that and we'll have a second round of newspaper front pages in the media buzz at 10.30. But first, is Sunak just trying to keep up with his political nemesis Boris Johnson by attending COP27 in his first worrying U-turn. Father to the former PM and conservationist Stanley Johnson. He's with me live straight after the break. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. 
every morning from six o'clock. We'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Way. Now, Fishy Wishy Sunak has performed a screechy U-turn, confirming today that he will attend the COP27 climate summit in Egypt after all. There is no long-term prosperity without action on climate change, and there is no energy security without investment in renewables. That's why I will attend COP27 next week to deliver, to deliver, Mr Speaker, on Glasgow's legacy of building a secure, clean and sustainable future. Sunak's initial decision to skip the summit so he could focus on domestic issues was widely criticised by lefty climate hysterics, but the PM seemingly only caved after a certain political rival announced he'd be going. Are you going to go to COP27? Well, yes, as it happens, but um, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's not relevant to Ukraine. But that, I, I, was, I was invited, I was invited by, by, the, by the Egyptians, so I'm very happy to go. Well, I'm joined now in the studio by Boris Johnson's father, former MEP and climate conservationist and activist, Stanley Johnson. So, Stanley, do you believe this was the right decision for Sunak to U-turn and go to COP27? Because I actually thought he'd made a very bold stand by staying. Well, and your use of language has always a U-turn, but I don't know. Anyhow. Look, it's a right, I'm not going to accept the, the premise, but I will accept that it was the right decision to go. It had to be the right decision. Why? Because we had a record. We have a record. Mm. We have helped a lot. You know, we did run COP26. Yeah. Alok Sharma did a good job. And if you remember, at the end of the Glasgow conference, he said, wow, we kept 1.5 alive. 1.5 alive, which was, of course... But there's a lot going on here at the moment, Stan. Yes, so, so, so there may be. But I tell you, if we don't keep our eye on the ball... And the other thing, the other thing, I think, is that Mr Sunak is there. He's there because we are the president. We, 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 by the way, we're still the president until the, the gang, the, 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 the gavel falls on... No, the gavel begins, whatever happens, starts. So the kick-off. We are still the president, so normally speaking, you'd expect to be there. But actually, we have a huge stake in this one. We, we, we really do, because we are as going to be as affected as anybody else if we don't get our facts in order. And the other thing which I think Mr Sunak really needs to concentrate on is our reputation is at stake at the moment, too. As you know, um, you know, we have a situation where a bill has been put forward before, before Parliament, which is, a, I've got to say, a totally crazy bill. It says, let us scrap... 750 environmental regulations, let us scrap around 2,000 other regulations, and then we can get ministers to invent, you know, some new, some new thing. And other people are going to pick up on that. And I think Mr Sunak will realise that as well as, you know, talking about our record, which is good, the G7, mm -hmm. you know, the biodiversity conference, this conference, our own environment, actually, as well as talking about that record, he has to have to, I think he has to say, actually, folks, I'm going to pull But that's back. not why he's doing this, though. He's doing this 
for political reasons, because he's so worried about your son. And to be honest, I think he should be worried about Boris, because I think it's... I, I think... Uh, Boris should be Prime Minister well, again. And actually, if the vote, Stanley, had gone to the Conservative Party members, mark my word, Boris Johnson would be in number 10 Downing Street. And there was that anti-democratic disgrace stitched up by the MPs, uh, which kept Boris off the ballot and forced him to pull out of the contest. Well, you might argue, if you're arguing democratic votes, you might say how democratic is uh, a Tory party membership of about, about 160,000. Yeah, but you use, you use the word democratic. You know, if, I, if I'm talking democracy, I, I would... would, would well, but prefer. Boris already had the mandate from the 2019 well, no, of course, Of course, I do agree. Let, let's not revisit this one. We are where we are. Mr Sunak is going to Egypt. That's, a, that's an important point. We have a lot of good things mm. to say. And I want him to say firmly... I'm not only going to go to Egypt, yeah. but I'm going to go to Montreal. Now, you don't know so much about Montreal, but Montreal... You're is... going. I am going to Montreal, although it's been very cold, much colder than Sharm El Sheikh. Montreal is... I hope you're going in a yacht, Greta Thunberg <laughs> yeah, yeah. style. <laughs> well, I think the ice flows will make it difficult to reach Montreal. No, COP15. Yeah. Well, you may say, how come COP27 becomes COP15? Because that, that mm. COP stands for Conference of the Parties, and these are different parties. Mm. These are parties to something called the Convention on Biological Diversity. Okay, okay. I, I, under, I understand yeah. that, but I think it is important, Stanley, that we acknowledge what's going on politically, because for your party, the Conservative Party, this has been the most torrid of months. And what you have to understand, Stanley, is there's a lot of people within your party who are loyal to your son and who feel like they have been denied a vote that was promised to them, and at the moment, there is a real democratic crisis facing the party. At the same time, in Boris's statement withdrawing from the race, he made it abundantly clear that he doesn't believe his political career is over. He's going to uh, cop. He's also doing some really important work to back up what he did in Ukraine. So it doesn't feel to me like this is the end of Boris Johnson as a political force. Well, I can tell you that former presidents former prime ministers, they do have a role and some of them cease to be former and become president again. Mm. Um, Which might happen with Boris, you would concede. Yeah. Well, he might. It's not, it's not, not totally inconceivable. But I am focusing on, on, on the present here. So, mm. yes, I'm pleased that... So you back Sunak now as I, a Conservative member? Of course I back Sunak. He is the, he is the prime minister. Uh, uh, of course I back him, and okay. I 100% do back him, and I think he's saying the right things, and I think he's particularly saying the right things. I don't want to sound like a broken reed. I'm not sure that he has absolutely grasped yet no. the real danger this this, no. this reason no, I get that. presents. Um, Sally, I have to talk to you about another big yeah, thing on. in the news, because, of course, something else you're very famous for is your brilliant stint in the Australian jungle, and I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Very controversially, uh, your son's health secretary, until he had to resign in disgrace, Matt Hancock, has confirmed he's entering the jungle even though he remains the MP for West Suffolk. Is this really appropriate, Stanley? Well, I think you should have a democratic view of this. <laughs> and the democratic view might, might show that, yeah, people do. I tell you what I say to myself. Look, this fellow, he wrote, by the way, a pretty good piece in The Sun this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This morning. It, yeah. Well, it's a very good piece. And, it's very good. and he stresses that his actually motivation here is to say something oh, about... Oh, please. No, no, you may say, oh, please. No, don't say, oh, please, because... Dyslexia. You haven't bought into that. I've certainly bought into it. He wants the £350,000, Stanley. Do you know, when I did it, I persuaded myself that one of the reasons I was doing The Jungle <laughs> was for getting up the money, because I said, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to talk about climate change. I'm going to bore the socks off them. I'm talk, <laughs> and I'm even going to talk about biodiversity. Well, you always do that. <laughs> I, I, I can always bore the socks off. Anything. And there they all were. They were brilliant people. There was, there was uh, yeah, Amir, uh, Amir, Amir Khan... Toff. Toff. There was um, Shappy, Shappy Corsandi. There was Becky Vardy, mm. who's now become tremendously mm. famous now because of Wagner's Crazy. And I did talk to them quite often. I said to myself, I bet they're showing that back in England. Of course, when I did come and look yeah, at but it. But what back... about the fact he's a serving MP? That's wrong, isn't it? Because if there's a massive event in, in uh, West Suffolk, 
There's no way he's contactable. Well, my understanding, I, I'm by no means an expert on this, and of course I do absolutely know that we didn't have any contact at no, all, no, except no. once I got a message from my wife saying, you know, are you sure you're losing weight? Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was. Anyway, apparently, apparently there is some sort of break, break clause in Matt Hancock contract which says if some unforeseeable event happens in, in West Sussex, like an inundation resulting from you know, global warming or whatever, or something really bad, because actually you suffer, because I do did have a, you know, a flood from time to time, then he can get out. OK, interesting. There's a scoop there from Stanley Johnson, <laughs> a contestant on I'm a Celebrity in 2017. Stanley, thank you so much. But coming up, as Gareth Southgate again gushes about the controversial Qatar World Cup, is switching off the tournament the only way to send a message to the virtue-signalling hypocrites of the England team? Follow us extraordinaire Rod Little uncancelled at that at 10.45. But first, as a lefty academic goes viral after calling for a COVID amnesty, should we forgive pandemic hysterics who waged war on our civil liberties? My panel tackle that and we'll deliver more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages straight after the break. We are GB News and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel.
Let's return to tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. More front pages have been delivered. The Guardian leads with reports that the Home Office left migrants bound for the Manston Centre on a London street near Victoria train station. The paper writes they were left disorientated and flimsy clothes with nowhere to stay. Rishi Sunak is planning to axe every policy promised in his leadership campaign, writes The Independent. Number 10 has admitted that the PM is planning to ditch spending pledges like the HS3 link, sparking fresh calls for an election. The Sun, leading with BBC covers up Fleur's strictly tumble. According to the paper, pop singer Fleur won last week's dance off despite a disastrous fall that was kept secret from viewers. She was allowed to restart her performance after the blip and ultimately beat East Ender star James Bay in the dance off. What a fix! What a disgrace! Uh, they also report Matt Hancock's Simon Celeb fee is actually closer to £400,000 and is one of the largest ever. Lies camera action is the brilliant headline in the Daily Mirror as the paper takes aim at Hancock for ditching his constituents to enter I'm a Celebrity. According to the paper, his work from camp claim is a lie. His kit for vanity videos was paid for by us and the publication wants him out of the jungle and back in Westminster. The Times leads with Rishi Sunak's plans for a big tax grab from energy firms to raise an estimated 40 billion over five years. And one on six of us born overseas, writes the Daily Mail, as census data reveals a dramatic social shift in just a decade. It's reportedly driven by a surge of Romanians. More on the media buzz now with tonight's superstar panel. Former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, the entrepreneur and activist Adam Brooks and the broadcaster Ashley James. Now, the insanity of the COVID era will be talked about for centuries to come. Uh, the lies, coercion, bullying, manipulation, snitching and discrimination towards the unvaccinated spawned a toxic medical apartheid. Kids' educations, businesses, the economy and relationships were also ripped to shreds at the altar of COVID authoritarianism. And here's a grim reminder of how the unvaxxed in particular were spoken about at the height of the pandemic. For unvaccinated, we are looking at a winter of severe illness and death. Those who haven't had jabs but could have jabs need to have a badge saying unjabbed. It can really spread like wildfire amongst the unvaccinated groups. two different classes of people if you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated you have all these rights if you are vaccinated that is what it is so yep yep vaccinated person having a heart attack yes come right on in we'll take care of you unvaccinated guy who gobbled horse goo rest in peace wheezy and the government's telling me what to do that's right the government is telling you what to do shut up be respectful of other people and get a vaccine just despicable now, with the stay home, stay safe smokescreen evaporated and even Pfizer execs admitting that aspects of the vaccine, like its impact on transmission, were untested, the people responsible for all the hysteria are calling for their victims to forgive and forget. In a viral article for the Atlantic magazine, lefty U.S. University professor Emily Oster has called for a, quote, pandemic amnesty, where we, quote, forgive one another for what we did and said when we were in the dark about COVID. She argues that we made complicated choices in the face of deep uncertainty. That sounds like Emily Oster excusing her own behaviour during COVID, including this tweet, demanding that because shaming the unvaccinated hadn't worked, they should instead be refused the right to travel socialize and work. But Adam Brooks, I'm sorry, given we were two of the people who were absolutely the target of so much mm -hmm. personal hatred because we stood against lockdowns and we stood up for the rights of the unvaccinated. I'm sorry, I can't just forgive and forget <laughs> because so many people continued with this divisive, revolting messaging, even though the facts were not there to Look, back it up. At the end of the day, we were proven right. Data has been on our side. And, and the recent studies are on our side. You know, you, you don't have to be a scientist to know that. I stood against uh, vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, school closures. You know, I put my head above the parapet. I was called a granny killer. You know, I was called selfish. I was called every name under the sun online. You know, and these people, look, I'd be very surprised if some of these media figures were not paid to say these things. They can't be that disgusting. They can't have been 
that well, look, loads of them were getting stupid. so much work because they yeah. were going with that government narrative and they were on TV shows all the time. Dawn Neeson, are you just prepared to forgive and move on? No, of course not. I'm still very angry. I think I'll always be very angry that we were constantly being fed a worst-case scenario. You know, even when there was a better-case scenario, we weren't even giving it down. No, no this it was covered up. Deliberately terrorised a population and the mental health effects of this mm. will go on for yeah. years. And the media was in lockstep. Um... The media was in lockstep. I, right? not, not, not all parts of the media were. Some of us did try to. I mean, I wrote columns throughout saying, look, you know, please stop terrorising people. And I had a heated debate with Piers Morgan on, on TV about this, the thing. Not about vaccine or anti-vaccine or anything like that, but just the, the terrorising of a population that were naturally mm. terrorised. He was one of the biggest figures. I'll never forgive anyone who did that, ever. I'm sorry. Because people... People said goodbye to loved ones mm. by remote. Yeah. People weren't allowed people, to go to funerals. People, people were begging outside of hospitals to, to be allowed in to see a dying relative and health professionals showed them no humanity. I mean, Ashley James, are you prepared to forgive? I feel really upset about lockdown and I feel like I came out a very different person because of the impact lockdown mm. had on me. I think a lot of us did. I... Did a lot. I get upset thinking about it because of what I felt like I went through. But I did a lot of my first pregnancy and childbirth alone. Um, and I. It's just appalling. Sorry, I didn't know I was going to get upset. No, but it's so appalling, pregnant. and it shows the but human I feel really, impact. I feel also that I was pressured into having a vaccine because I didn't want to. My grand's terminally ill, and I was so worried that if I didn't have the vaccine. Obviously, I did it when I was pregnant, and obviously your first thought is always that you want to protect your child. But there was so much like anti-vax narrative that I felt like if I said that I didn't want to get it, that and then something happened to her that I would therefore be held responsible. Um, yeah, so what I would say that I, I do actually forgive and understand a lot of people that were so afraid that they were calling out for more lockdown restrictions because a lot of people went with the evidence that they were given. And I, I was really scared at the beginning. I was I was so afraid at the beginning, especially because it coincided when I found out I was pregnant. I used to tell Tommy off for going into the news agents to get, like, bits and bobs. I was like, no, we have to do one shop and try and live. I remember I thought it was going to be a zombie apocalypse because we were seeing dead bodies in the streets in New York. And at the time, you felt like if you were going to go to hospital, you'd go and die there. And obviously, I knew I had to go to hospital because I was going to have a baby. Um, I feel really upset that Pfizer and all the other companies knew that it wouldn't stop the spread for the transmission because that's why I personally did it because mm. I felt like I was doing mm. it for the greater good to protect mm. my relatives. Yeah. Um, no, it breaks. So, I, yes, I can forgive the people who were scared and therefore saying things because they felt that that was the right thing. I can't forgive people like Matt Hancock yeah. who essentially put people back in care homes to die, and now he's been handed... Yeah. Morgan, I probably could forgive him. I know that he was a big scaremonger, but, again, he was going off the information that was being fed to him. But I, I don't forgive people like the scientists who probably knew that it wasn't as bad as it was, and they and terrified break, us. Breaking the rules and, and also, yeah. I had friends... Obviously, everyone has their different personal situations, and my situation is in no near as bad as other people's. But I had, a, I had a friend whose dad has terminal cancer. She didn't see him for that whole period, and she lives on her own. Like, she was basically suicidal, completely on her own, afraid of dating, and couldn't see her father. Like, how do you forgive, how do you forgive what uh, you people can't. like Dan, that go through? Spy B, Spy B and the nudge unit have a lot to answer for. I'm upset seeing Ashley upset mm. here. They did a job on everyone, right? And Laura, who was here earlier, her book, fantastic, Laura, yes, you know, a state yeah. of fear. Exactly, and, and the thing is, a book like that, though, which actually I um, was interviewed for and I'm quoted in that book, we did the interviews for that book in early 2020. Yeah. You could know if you were prepared to look. Yeah. If you were prepared Fine. to block out the propaganda, you could know. But, Ashley, thank you so much for sharing your story because I found that really emotional too. Coming up, the crowning moment of the show as my superstar panel return to name tonight's greatest Britain and union jackass. But first, as Gareth Southgate again gushes about the controversial Qatar World Cup, is switching off the tournament the only way to send a message to the virtue-signalling hypocrites of England? Rod Little up! In just a few seconds' time, first though, here's what's coming up on tomorrow's show. 
Coming up on Dan Wooden Tonight, as his Netflix paymasters recreate harrowing scenes of his mother's death for the crown, has Prince Harry trapped himself into a hell of his own making? Maureen Callahan, the DailyMail.com columnist famed for branding Meghan the Duchess of Despair and the toddler with the tiara, weighs in on the latest Sussex drama. Plus, self-proclaimed chief gammon June Slater brings the unfiltered takes that make her a social media sensation. And there's opinion galore from Fleet Street icon Calvin McKenzie, Woke Slayer and Chief Charlie Lawson, and my superstar panel conservative commentator Dominique Samuels, former Tory London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and author and broadcaster Amy Nicall. That's Dan Woodson tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Now, England's woke Wally of a football manager, Gareth Southgate, has been criticised by human rights groups after he claimed workers in Qatar were united and wanting the World Cup to go ahead. Watch. I've been out to Qatar several times and I've met with lots of the, um, the workers out there and they are united in... It's certainly one thing, that's that they want the tournament to happen and they want that because they love football. They want the football to come to Qatar. Oh my goodness. This is the thing about the Qatar World Cup. It's finally exposing the virtue signalling hypocrites throughout English football. Southgate advocates pointless gesture politics, but his moralism ends when it comes to the thousands of migrant workers who have died, died building the stadiums and the buildings that his players will probably take the knee in. Meanwhile, the Gobby Garys, Neville and Lineker and David Beckham have all nobly postponed their woke crusades for a month to broadcast and promote this wretched World Cup in the name of a few quid. So, Rod Little, I, sorry, I just can't get out over that Southgate interview, given that you only need to do the smallest amount of research in Qatar, in, into Qatar to know that so many of these workers have died building the stadium. So I, I actually can't believe, Rod, he said that today. He didn't talk to any of the dead ones. That's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he he was probably dragged to some building site where there were some approved people he could talk to, and he asked them, are you looking forward to the World Cup, my man? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. It is a naivety, a hypocrisy, and a gullibility of the highest order that is matched in its ineptitude only by his in inability to uh, coax a decent performance out of the England World Cup squad. Uh, because don't forget, this is the thing which which keeps getting forgotten, doesn't by me because I'm a football fan, that he has the worst record of any England manager over the last year, going back more than 70 years. He is an appalling manager. You know, we got stuffed 4-0 at home by Hungary. You know, the last time that happened, uh, we thought it was an earthquake back in the 1950s and, and football changed forever. But this man has presided over... The, the decline of England as a, as a football a footballing nation. But, but Rod, that, do people course, turn the blind point. eye because he's woke? Is, is that what this is? Is that yeah. what's going on? Well, of course, I, I mean, he is in an inviolable position because any time he's criticised, he bobs down on one knee. Uh, you know, he has been happy to sign up to all the performative virtue signalling of wokedom, but when it comes to actual things which might make a difference, which might make the world sit up a little bit, such as not going to the World Cup in Qatar, uh, he, he is found wanting, and so is his team. Although you say, uh, you know, you know he's, only, he's not making meaningful gestures, he has agreed to have our captain wearing a rainbow armband for one love. So that will sort it out, won't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, that will make it's, 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 it's even worse than that, because of all the teams in the World Cup, uh, England, England are the most vulnerable because on their first game, they're playing the lovable Islamic Democrats and women huggers of Iran. You know, should we be playing Iran at football when they're busy murdering protesters in Tehran and beyond? Should we be playing them at all? Again, Southgate can't be bothered to answer that question. It just doesn't figure on his radar. You mentioned David Beckham. It's a, It's a... Something which is furious to me that <clears throat> his awful video 
for which he got 150 million quid to promote Qatar as a stopover for people going to the World Cup. It, it's the first thing that comes up on my screen for an advert. And I, I, you know, if there, if there was a way I had of stopping it, I would do. But it is what it shows is much as you say, Dan, that all of this was meaningless drivel. All of the stuff he said was utterly without merit because when push comes to shove, there is nothing that he would give up in order you know, to actually make a difference in the world. It's all mouth and no trousers. So, so, Rod, where do you personally stand on this as a football fan? Because I find it fascinating. Uh, for example, with our superstar panel uh, tonight, Dawn Neeson, who's a big football fan, has previously said she won't be watching the games. But Adam Brooks, who obviously is a publican and, and you know, football's big business at his pubs, he will be showing them. So personally, where do you stand? Well, I, I feel sorry for Adam because you know this would normally be a big time for mm. for, for, for Adam Brooks and, and his and his business. And by God, our, our pubs and clubs and, and restaurants all need this kind of business. And undoubtedly, football brings them in. I won't be watching it. Uh, I mean, there are three really at all. Is, no, no, I won't. I, I won't. And it, it's the first time, you know, Dan. It, it's it's a cry and shame. I can remember getting up at five o'clock in the morning in 1970. Uh, to get up early to watch the reruns of football games from the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. I absolutely love World Cups because it unites two things I really enjoy. One of them is football. The other is being rude about foreigners. Um, and I, I, those are two things which have always appealed to me uh, as a human being. But I can't watch, watch this. I, I can't bear to see England led by Gareth Southgate. I can't bear to see it played in a place which was a fix, a corrupt fix by FIFA. Uh, uh, to have the, the World Cup in Qatar. And also, I resent having it played in the middle of November, uh, end of November, beginning of December, when my own club, who I support, are still playing important games. Uh, and all of that's happened, of course, because they gave it to Qatar, which it should never have happened. No, I I'm with you, actually. I'm with you. Uh, I think it's a complete disgrace. Yeah. I, I, I really am. Uh, columnist extraordinaire Rod Little. Brilliant as ever. We will speak next week, Rod. Uh, but it's time now for my superstar panel to return and reveal today's greatest British and Union jackass. Dawn Neeson, who's your nominee for greatest Brit? The greatest Brit is there with me. Matt Hancock. <laughs> for doing what? The one, for doing the one thing I don't think anyone else in this country could do, and that's uniting us all in the <laughs> hatred of one person. Apart so from Linda well Copic. Done, Matt. Apart from Limba Kopik, who is probably the one person defending him in the country and did oh, so early in the exception. clash. <laughs> Adam Brooks, you're Mine is the, uh, my greatest Britain is the Daily Telegraph for their articles, their numerous articles, highlighting the wrongs and the damages that lockdown have caused, <coughs> uh, especially in highlighting the non-COVID excess deaths as well. Um, they've really been sort of uh, vocal on this and I applaud them. They have been brilliant. They really have. Ashley, Bro uh, Ashley James, your nominee. <laughs> um, my Greatest Britain is the March for Mummies protest. I went to it the weekend, calling for government action to reform childcare to help struggling families. It's worth noting that 54,000 women are forced to leave their jobs every year because they can't afford childcare. And a large percentage of wanted pregnancies are terminated because people cannot afford children. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to go with Adam Brooks and the Daily Telegraph. Uh, one of the newspapers that I would say, along with uh, the Daily Mail, have always been very focused on the harms of lockdowns. There's so much reporting out there to be done on this. I think it's the tip of the iceberg, and I really hope uh, newspapers with credibility like the Daily Telegraph stay on this. Uh, Dawn Neeson, uh, your Union Jackass nominee, please. Funny enough, it's Matt Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got for both of your nominees tonight. For living up to the second part of his name and going out to the jungle to eat Willie. <laughs> Adam Brooks. My Union Jackass is Rishi Sunak. Uh, for you turning uh, and now going to the COP27. Uh, I just think it's so weak and embarrassing. It's... it's unjustifiable in my, in my Yeah, and I also think that politically, Adam, uh, this will come back to bite him because we saw what happened to trust the moment that she U-turned and now Sunak is going down The voters path. will hate this then. Yeah. Ashley James, your nominee. 
Um, my Union Jackass is the Home Office, uh, just for the total <coughs> policy failure and the migrant crisis that we face. Um, it's been a complete revolving door, so there's been no consistency, only processing 4% of asylum seekers, and, of course, um, the fact that migrants, lots of um, women and children facing absolutely appalling conditions. Mm, OK. Well, look... I am going to go uh, with the Hancock. Which is unique, Dawn, because this makes him a winner two days in a row, which I don't <laughs> usually do. But the reason that I've done that is because he wrote that ridiculous piece in the Sun newspaper today trying to claim that it's nothing to do with the £400,000. I thought it was £350,000. No, 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 it's closer to £400,000. It's nothing to do with that. It's, it's, Donate it's it then, I Matthew. I want to be with people my message of dyslexia. Not in the jungle, Matt. Yeah, delusional. Donate it, Matthew. Yeah, donate it all. Uh, Adam Brooks, Ashley James, Dawn Neeson, my fabulous superstar panel, thank you all so much. I am, of course, back tomorrow night at 9pm. Thank you for your company tonight. I've absolutely loved it. The Headliners gang next. Good night. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubry, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. On The Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's... Po Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart. And I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6 a.m., you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know, the latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6 a.m., it's breakfast on GB News.
Hello, I'm Polly Middlehurst in the GB Newsroom. Headliners is next. Let's bring you up to date first with the latest top stories here. And two Metropolitan Police officers have been sentenced to three months in prison for sending grossly offensive messages with Wayne Cousins before he murdered Sarah Everard. And a warning if you're watching on television, the following does contain some flash photography. PC Jonathan Cobbin and former PC Joel Borders shared messages of a racist, homophobic and misogynistic nature in a WhatsApp group in 2019. The pair have been bailed ahead of an appeal against their convictions in the High Court. And the Prime Minister has today been...